Welcome back. This is module two of our uh, program, our, our eighth lesson online program on precision agriculture in the southeast. And module two is going to be about GPS. Dr. John Fulton, welcome back. Uh, before we get into GPS, let's talk about our Precision Ag Team webpage. Yeah, so a lot of the discussion we'll have not only here about GPS, we're going to hear some other acronyms commonly used, GNSS here in this module, and CORES. You can find that on our website, which is alabamaprecisionagonline.com. And uh, not only today, but some of the other modules, you can look down the left side here. We also have presentations and publications materials that really go into some of these topics and try and explain them down to kind of that novice level. Our focus here uh, within the extension system here in Alabama is farmers and uh, consultants and, and our ag industry here in the state. So it's really, you know, what's, what's the real meaning of some of this technology benefits and that's what it, this has been set up for. So, you know, we're going to get into detail here on just GPS. You can pull that up and see we've got a pretty extensive pub, publication list plus presentations that several of the team mem members have made over the years at various uh, conferences, workshops, or even field days, but trying to bring uh, better clarity to this topic um, because, you know, GPS, as we mentioned, we, we kind of started uh, the introduction of that into agriculture in the early 90s. Uh, we thought by today we might be pretty standard and like your cell phone, you don't think about that being yeah. in there, but man, today uh, every farmer has a lot of options out there and, and it gets kind of confusing and that's we're going to try and go through some of that here today uh, Mark but anyways uh, good resource uh, for everyone uh, I encourage people when you're trying to look for something or understand something there's most likely we've got some material already developed to try and explain that in a little bit more depth we need to refer back to that as we go through our, our future lessons and look at the at that that's is it www.alabamaprecisionag.com or precisionag.com? Alabamaprecisionagonline.com. All, all small ladders across? Yep. Yep. Hey, that, that, we have so many resources online that you forget what's there. Yeah. Or it's just overwhelming, but I think this would really be a good, for somebody starting up, a good go to spot. Absolutely. Or even for some of the things uh, that come on board uh, and just need a little bit of explanation, we try and get some information on the forefront to explain, you know, whether someone's using an acronym or, or some kind of new, uh, or it appears to be a new technology, trying to explain that in a little bit better detail, what that means to, to the farm operation. John, I'll show you the extent of my knowledge. I understand GPS means Global Positioning System slash GNSS, I'm lost, brother. And that's Help what me we're, out. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try and, try and outline that in a little bit here yeah, in, in this us. module. Um, because I'll be learning with our folks at home because I don't know what GNSS means. Yeah. So, anyways, we're just going to try and get down to some of the nuts and bolts yes. here, Mark. That's what we're talking about is what's meaningful uh, to the farm operation or those out in agriculture and just we're not going to get real deep and technical on these things it's just understanding what they mean and uh, how you might be able to to ask questions when you're yes. investigating and whether I want to purchase or trying to figure out if I'm going to adopt some technology you know it's important just to understand some of these basics and what it might uh, provide to the to the farm operation so as you can see here today um, we've got several GPS and we'll try and use those as props. We appreciate those that uh, allowed us to borrow these here today, not only dealers, dealerships with some of our farmers. We just kind of pulled a few examples out to, to kind of talk about. So we're not going to go, but uh, on these we'll try and each, uh, each lesson we'll try and give a uh, uh, outcomes of what we're trying to do. Uh, but with this we're really wanting to talk about your question, what's GNSS, understand how GPS works. This correction, there's so many different corrections out there that you have access to and then some other things, but ultimately we're going to drive down just to some basic take-home messages at the end of what you really need to consider uh, if you're working in the ag industry as it relates back to GPS receivers. So with that, 
Um, let's talk about a little bit about GPS. Let's not forget, number one, um, that it's a satellite navigation system, essentially. Uh, these satellites are emitting, um, essentially, electromagnetic waves. Continuously on, on those waves, there's information that we can take advantage of, where that satellite is at, at any point in time. Basically, all that's broad, continuously broadcast. We only have a, a portion of those satellites available to us because you know, they're, they're orbiting the Earth. Our GPS receiver there on the tractor can take that information and, and very quickly calculate our position here on the surface of the Earth. That puts us basically on, a, on essentially a map or um, uh, some kind of longitude, latitude, or what we call a projection where we're talking meters and feet in some cases. But because it's being emitted, things like trees or other obstructions that might be between that satellite or satellites and the GPS receiver is something that could deter that signal getting through and us utilizing it. So a lot of times, let's just remember, when we talk about this navigation system, GPS, or shortly we'll talk about GNSS, we're talking about satellites orbiting Earth, taking that information that they're broadcasting, arriving at a position, uh, but anything that might be in between those two is, uh, could be uh, problematic in trying to calculate our position. So we just got to keep that in mind of where, where this information is uh, originating from. So. GPS, the two, first two things, a lot of people just, uh, the, the global positioning system, you mentioned that right up front. We'll talk just briefly on that on the next slide. Uh, but at the same time, there's this other concept, DGPS, or Differential Global Positioning System. And that's where we take information that we know about some of the inherent errors associated with that calculation or the timing errors that are associated from when the, the that um, signal is emitted from the satellite and reaches the, uh, our receiver on the equipment. Knowing what those errors are, we can back out and improve our positioning, okay? So DGPS is what normally when we talk about agriculture, we're talking about DGPS, something that's a position that has been corrected. Uh, typically, we're on a meter or less in what we use in agriculture, so that gets us down to that where we can put ourselves not only on, in a field, but very accurately in some cases at a point in that field over time. How big is a meter? How big is a meter? 3.281 feet. About a yard. That's right, just Pretty a little good. over a thank, yard. Thank you. So anyways, so just some common terminology, GPS, but then really what we talk about and most people uh, confuse is the DGPS. We're always correcting that data uh, or positional data to get us down to that yard or meter less. Well, uh, these uh, receivers that are on the table, uh, will all these, are they, they DGPS? Absolutely. They? Okay. All these on the table, and in most cases what's in your uh, smartphone or cell phone today will Would have a, a correction type signal on them as well that's, mm -hmm. uh, that can be utilized. So yes, pretty much, I don't know today anything in ag that's not corrected or non, okay. you know, just autonomous or what we call just GPS. So with that, just real quick, going back over, we've got 30 satellites up there today. Really what we'd have is 24 satellites at any one time that are active. Uh, these go around the earth twice per day uh, on average. The goal of this system, again, this was built by the Department of Defense initially for military uh, activities. You want about eight of those in view, but because of terrain and, and positioning, sometimes you know you might only get six in view or less in some cases, especially if you drop down into a valley. So uh, the uncorrected position error, um, that means just GPS only. You know, it's going to vary, but somewhere between 5 to 20 meters is a pretty good kind of rule of thumb. So maybe not getting us, if we're along the edge of the field, we could be out on the edge of yeah. the road. But so that's why the correction type, the DGPS is so important to get us in the field, get us accurately. The, the other thing that's important to know here, Mark, is we need four GPS satellites to compute a GPS position. Okay, essentially three will get you close. The fourth one's used both for a timing 
um, perspective, but also to, to rule out basically a second point that's out in space, but get us a position here on the surface of the Earth. So the important thing is, no matter what you're out there using from an ag, we always have to have four satellites in view for one of these things to just operate. We'll go back through that here in a little bit. Okay. The other aspect is we do have what we call geostationary satellites, which means they're orbiting at the same angular velocity as the Earth, meaning that you look out to southern space, think about direct TV, there's geostationary satellites broadcasting that continuously, that satellite transmission. So they're out in space, but from our perspective, because we're rotating at the same angular velocity, they never move in our sight. And so we use those to correct or broadcast some of this correction information, in some cases, uh, back onto the Earth so these can get that more accurate positioning here in agriculture. So just some, just some basics. Again, we're talking about satellites. 24 is the minimum. But really, we got a few spares up there that are, are either coming on board uh, or can be turned on in yeah. case something occurs. Uh, and uh, they're orbiting about twice a day. So, and we need four of those in order to get a position uh, here on Earth. With that, I just want to bring this, and this is just something that, that a lot of times you'll see on spec sheets, but back in the day when it came active and was available civilians, we always talked about the, the primary two signals that they were broadcasting in L1 and L2. Today, what we also talk about, if you look at some of the, the, the receivers here on the table, they'll actually be able to, to receive the L2C and L5C. And basically what that's telling us that we can use the data, those, the C you can think about as civilian information on those signals that we can use to derive a positional data. The L5 is unique uh, and is available uh, on a few satellites out there. Not all 24 are broadcasting mm -hmm. all the L2C and L5C at this point, but the idea here is more signals, a little bit different wavelength, and L5C, uh, L5C has a, a wavelength that potentially could help us in a canopy situation. So there's a little bit of, a little bit yeah. can get us through canopies where the L1 and L2 would be attenuated or not being able to pass through. So what that gives you is a little bit more precision and it also increases our availability out there. Attenuated. So, attenuated. I am impressed, John. <laughs> attenuated. Okay, and so. uh, the the four satellites. I know I'm jumping back a little bit, but but when we were first learning this, when they were first teaching the REAs about it, it was three. Wasn't it? Have, and, and the fourth is just increased uh, accuracy. Well, the fourth you typically just think of it as very simple here in a nutshell. It's going to give you longitude, latitude, and elevation, plus okay, give you yeah. some some accuracy on the timing aspect. So the important, one of the things that we should say out of GPS is you don't only get the positional data, so kind of that X, Y, Z, longitude, latitude, and elevation, but you also get kind of this velocity that's, that's pretty accurate out of it too. And so that's all dealing with this timing and making sure our timing is uh, correct uh, because of how it calculates um, your location here on Earth. So again, just recognize we're sending multiple singles, each satellite's uh, broadcasting multiple signals and there's different information possibly on those signals. We're not going to dive down into all of that. That's That can be looked at on the, web, the Precision Ag website. But uh, but anyways, there's multiple signals. The idea today, if I was going to go buy basically uh, this receiver right here, I would be ensuring myself it got L1, L2C, and L5C, the capability to read all yeah. those signals. Because if you don't, you know, if it's there, you're not going to be able to, to acquire that signal. So, just talking about GPS classes today, the way we talk about it in our program is that you have submeter level type correction. Okay, and this is the DGPS far. You got kind of that decimeter, which might be somewhere between 10, 20, or 30 centimeters of accuracy. Or uh, how much of a football field would that be? That would be a decimeter. A decimeter. That would be a touchdown. If you were a decimeter <laughs> away, you would be there. We would be, the nose of the football would probably be close to the goal line. Okay. So we're talking uh, very accurate, 10 centimeters to 20 to 30 centimeters. Very, very accurate. And then finally, centimeter level accuracy, or what we normally, a lot of folks will term as RTK, and we'll go into that in more detail. Rules of thumb here, going back to, in order for me to get a location, I have to have four satellites. 
when we jump to this concept of using RTK, okay, you have to have five satellites at any point in time. So if I'm looking at four satellites, I'm down in a valley and I'm using GPS and I'm trying to use RTK, I will tell you it will not basically get a what we call a fixed location and so your inability to get that centimeter level accuracy is not possible. So four for GPS, five is a really good rule of thumb for RTK. Um, and so just to be thinking about that, you're out in your tractor, we'll, we'll show some pictures here in a little bit, you come up between a, a tree line, you were tracking eight or nine satellites, all of a sudden you knock half of them out, I'm not going to be able to use RTK. So. So here's your first question and probably the most important. This is probably the, one of the more um, important features that have really helped our Alabama farmers in the last five years. When we first came out, we talked about GPS receivers and that would be a GPS only, meaning that it's a um, using only the U.S. satellites up there or what the U.S. global positioning system out there. Today, uh, we have primarily the Russian system, which is somewhat of very similar, not equivalent, but similar, uh, called GLONASS down at the bottom. The Europeans continue to try and develop their own. We also have India and China trying to develop very similar type systems. But the concept here is, is GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. So if I take, as an example here today, Mark, um, here on the table, I've got a Trimble, what we call an R8. This is a surveying GPS receiver, but if I look at right here on this receiver, it says GNSS, meaning that it can track both the U.S. and GLONASS, which are active today. It also has the capability of looking at Galileo once it comes online in the future. So more satellites up there more opportunity to continue to, to have to maintain a location or calculating a location. So this one has GNSS. Backing up, and we'll use John Deere as an example today, this is their older Starfire ITC uh, receiver, and it is a GPS only receiver, Mark. So if you look at some of these old um, combines or tractors and you see ITC, for example, this would be a GPS only. A few years ago John Deere came out with their Starfire 3000 receiver sitting here um, on the left and this is a GNSS receiver. So immediately again tracking only US satellites here. Over here we're tracking both GLONASS and US satellites. So sometimes it's not marked on some of the ag receivers, some of them they do. Um, but a lot of times, especially on a surveying, if you look right on the, on the receiver, that's what this would be, or an antenna, you'll see that marked mm -hmm. very clearly, and that gives you uh, uh, much more capabilities of working in, up against tree lines, up against buildings, things like that, because you have such a uh, much more satellites out there to track and, and compute location on or position. So if we look at this as an example, here, here we are working along the, the edge of the field, uh, we're using GPS only, we're doing fine, we come up along the tree line, all of a sudden we're blocking two satellites, we were tracking five as an example, guess what happens? Three satellites, yeah. the technology's not yeah. working. It's a yard different. And uh, we're not being able to, the, the basically, the internally to some of these systems uh, will not function. We don't have GPS to, to function. So that is an example, and if you remember back 10, even sometimes five years ago, Mark, you remember some of the guys saying they plant the whole field, they come down the last two passes, and guess what? The marker had to come back out and make those last two passes, yeah. and this is, this is what happened. We were basically shading out satellites. So pretty much everyone in the industry that, that's really active um, is, has turned our attention and really offers this. In most cases, it's not going to be a, um, an option. It's just like this Starfile 3000. You're basically getting a GNSS with the automatic purchase of, of this receiver. So now, if I've got shading along the side of the, of the woods there, or trees, 
all of a sudden, well, I still maintain a more than sufficient number of satellites to give me a calculation, plus give me a calculation that maintains the accuracy level that I want, and I can plant those last two passes without putting that marker back down. In most cases, if you go up and talk to a lot of our farmers across the state that have switched from GPS to GNSS, so again, GNSS meaning we're tracking the U.S. satellites plus the Russian GLONASS satellites, they have very little, if any, issues today about finishing a field and working up against tree lines or back in the corner or anything today. So uh, a really, really um, positive thing if you're going out shopping for any of this technology when it deals with a GPS receiver, get you one, it's GNSS. And like I said, if you're buying deer today, you already have it. Okay. So, um, you know, and same with Trimble or, or Top Con or anyone else. So all it is is more satellites, more operational time. If we look at this examples and you can go back and, and go back through here, typically your best case we might have eight or nine GPS. If we get near trees, we drop down to potentially being pretty scarce on satellites and maybe not have enough to do. But when we go to the GNSS, that greatly enhances. And it's not, we've had issues, we have had times during the day where we might be tracking 18 satellites in a GNSS. And again, improve reliability. In most cases, we never know if we're losing satellites or not. We just keep on going. So that's the first thing. Hopefully we got your GNSS concept. Again, on the website, we have a full publication that explains GNSS. The, the second thing I wanted to talk about is accuracy and um, and then reliability. Accuracy, I think most of us know, is how close we are to, to the true position. Reliability is your uptime. How long, you know, do I have any, do I lose correction and I'm down? Or did I lose satellites and I'm sitting there waiting for satellites to come back and view? So those are two things that a lot of people need to ask when they're talking about correction services and trying to think through this. What accuracy do I really need? and how reliable is the correction service that I'll be obtaining from you because I do not want to be in the middle of planning and be down for a day waiting on someone to give me, get the correction service back up for me. There's two classes of uh, GPS or GNS receivers. We're going to talk through non-RTK, okay, anywhere from a meter to decimeter type level. You'll hear the term drift, GPS drift, meaning that basically because of the way the satellites are constantly moving in and out of our viewpoint up there in the sky. Uh, but essentially, if I set my receiver, you'll see that position move over time. That would be an easy way. I set my receiver, I got a position, you'll notice it just kind of drifts or move. And it varies on the type of receiver and the correction I'm using. But if it's non-RTK type correction, it will drift. I'll show you a picture of that. RTK is, is, doesn't change over time. We'll talk about that even more here in a second. These are just some ideas. We have WAS out there that a lot of people will take advantage of. That's a free service, okay? Uh, the FAA manages that. Um, that's kind of what we would call a meter to meter and a half type accuracy. We have what, what, what we define as single frequency, so SF1 by John Deere or Omnistar XP. Dual frequency, which is really getting down into this decimeter level accuracy, and then RTK there. And, and, and basically that centimeter, repeatable centimeter level accuracy. But those are the three categories we use to talk about GPS correction. Again, depends on what kind of field operation I'm doing. Might depend on what category I need to jump into immediately there. So here's an example that just telling you your accuracies as you move out from like a WAS up at the top. You can see kind of plus or minus three feet. And as you move down to that RTK, you can see it really the deviation is down to that centimeter level accuracy or inch level accuracy down there at the bottom. So what we've tried to do is just give a kind of a, a visual to accuracy, that being that envelope coming down. And as you get to RTK, you're pretty much always going to be around that zero uh, deviation point. Here's another way to look at that. This is data that, that uh, we collected on the right side. One thing we need to, and we, it, this is hard to understand for some, some of us, but pass to pass versus long term. Pass to pass is normally defined, if I make a pass down the field, I turn around and come back, within 15 minutes of that prior pass, what is my deviation yeah. off of that AB line per se? 
So that's pass the pass. As long as I'm within 15 minutes, what is my expected accuracy? So you'll see anywhere from uh, 6 to 13 inches on WAS. Okay. If you go to the right side, we talk about long-term accuracy, Mark. So if mm -hmm. I pull into a field today and I want to put myself right on that cotton row and I come in next year and I want to put my nose at the middle of the tractor right back exactly on the middle of that cotton row, then I'm going to need to be down there in that RTK, that plus or minus one inch on that long-term accuracy. Again, down the right side, you can see basically... Well, that's quite a difference, John. Looking at between <coughs> wasps, 4.7 feet and RTK one inch. Absolutely. That's not insignificant even in, in any application. Absolutely. And that's just something to consider. You know, if I've got a visual out there, but you'll notice if we take your WAS example, that carpet is centered on a, a row of cotton, and those are 40 inch yeah. cotton rows. And you'll notice the blue zone from left to right actually extends beyond plus or minus one row. Okay, so I could actually be one row over or one row to the right or left. Or your tractor wands. tire could be right on the row and lose a row. Absolutely. So, but if you notice that real, there's kind of a real thin green line going down the center, that's RTK, meaning this wow. year, next year, next week, six months will put me right on the same row. That's, that's a very good slide. That's so, a good slide. So if I'm a peanut producer, that's why we get all of our peanut producers in the south part of the state really taking on RTK. I can plant, yeah. but I can put my digger right back over there and not have to worry about this, this issue occurring. So just different types of correction, WAS, submeter, decimeter, RTK, some visuals for folks to kind of to kind of digest and look at on this. Okay. Just some cost, you know. Nothing necessary other is free. Some of these you're going to have to pay for. These are just kind of nominal yearly subscriptions. Um, all I'll say is that these costs may vary where you're at and the dealer that you might have, but just gives you an idea that while single frequency, it's not until you get to single or dual frequency that uh, you're, you're paying for something or will need to pay for something as an example. So just something to think about. So those are kind of just a nominal non-RTK. Let's go through some RTK stuff because for the most part, what most of our, you'll find, Mark, is the word here in Alabama is RTK is addictive. When I can put myself right back on, Man, how many yeah. of the farmers you know are, have moved themselves, all their machines are RTK now? Well, you look at that eight to fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, how much savings in crop would you have to have to get that on the acres we're doing? Just nothing. John, what's that kinematic? Just real quick, what's that mean? So RTK is real time kinematic. Kinematic. Kinematic, and it, it's just a it's a basically a, a method or a solution to get us down to that repeatable one inch or centimeter level accuracy. You know, back in the day, we used it for auto guidance. Basically, yes. the peanut producers were quick here in the state to adopt it. But now, you know, we're using it on some of the harvesters to keep these wide mm -hmm. uh, platforms, you know, from um, running full, basically keeping them running full. And so it's, uh, like I said, very addictive. So real-time kinematic, uh, it's repeatable, as we already saw in the pr prior mm -hmm. slides, uh, down to that centimeter. You know, thinking about, again, on the peanuts on the right side or if we're on the left side and we're wanting to try and uh, be very accurate and not have any overlap or skips, RTK's what you need to use. To have RTK, and we, we won't get into all this today, but you have to have some kind of base station or multiple base stations that basically are stationary. They're over a known point, and they, what they essentially do is calculate the error at any point in time that's in the GPS or GNSS and broadcast that back out to the rover. So you see here, here's the John Deere base station along the edge of the field. You see a, uh, a radio antenna, so there's a radio uh, on the tractor would be something like we see here on the table, the Starfire 3000. It has a radio receiver cor taking that correction data and maintaining that centimeter level accuracy. But you have to have this base station uh, or a network of base stations to get that accuracy. And there's, I could use a radio to broadcast that. I could use a cell phone, as we talk about today, or a modem today. So through cellular connections, we can have that occurring. Um, 
John, if, if you were doing land leveling, you know, for irrigation or drainage, and to, that you, that's very precise, would, would this be what you'd want? You would have to be totally in the RTK category, whether that's deer, tremble, topcon, okay. as an example. Uh, any of them, you would have to be RTK uh, using to get to land leveling. Uh, so, yep. So you got this base station on your on your tractor. You'd have again a, a receiver with some kind of radio or modem on that, uh, and you'd work through your display, like's behind us here today, um, whether that's Ag Leader, John Deere's display to set that up or, or get that set up, and then you're you're off and running. And so you got this base station. You have a rover, but you got to have something that communicates through them. And like I said, it could be a, a modem, could be a cell phone, could be a radio, like here on the John Deere. Or in some cases now we're talking about broadcasting it over that through that geostationary satellite, as an example would be uh, Trimble's RT, RTX product uh, or OmniStar's uh, products as well. So very important. I think the confusion lies a lot of time is what are my options to get that base station? Where as a farmer, what do I need or who do I need to turn to to figure out what the best correction to get my RTK? because not all of them are the same, Mark. And that's, like I said, there's different ways of communicating. Everyone has a little bit different solutions. And so once you pick something, you're kind of tied to it and hopefully it's gonna work uh, for you. Um, one thing to remember here in Alabama, we have public versus private. Typically our public would be an example is that ALDOT cores. That's free, I can use it. I can use it on my mapping. If I have an internet connection and can get the data, on the private side, I'm going to have to pay, typically, yeah. an annual subscription. Or the other idea is I can buy a personal base station like you saw in the prior slide. So I can buy a base station, but then I'm responsible for managing that base station. And most of our guys are spread over a lot of acres yeah. or counties. You're going to have to move that base station because most of the time that base station, at least in Alabama through our research, maybe six miles maximum that you're going to get out of that. And so if I'm stretching over 20, 30, 40 miles, guess Particularly what? Particularly with a few mountains between. Hills, trees, woods. Yeah. I'm going to be moving my base station a lot. So there's time. And what we've seen over the last three, four, or five years, most guys that have started with the base station have gotten rid of that and either gone to one of their Trimble dealer or John Deere dealer or someone similar and purchased a solution that basically that company maintains but as far as I know there's a local base station to me and I'm running RTK and I don't have to worry about that and I don't have any expense in that. Yes the, the slide you had earlier that accuracy and reliability and we need one more time. Time. You know you got those three things it's just okay that we got everything it's got to be on time it's got to be reliable and dependable and, and so accurate. As an example, talking about that, if I'm using a radio, again, that's a land-based system, and so anything that's going to come between that base station for the most part and the rover, especially as I get several miles away, is going to attenuate or interrupt and not allow that to work. So radios can be great. Um, they work good, but for most people, what they find out is they're going to be buying some kind of cellular type subscription, whether that's to Trimble VRS, My Way RTK is another type company out there selling. And uh, there's different ways, but you're buying those subscriptions and, and not having to worry about that part. That, so with that, I'm going to talk about real-time networks just real quick because that networks is something that's thrown out when we talk mm -hmm. about RTK for our farmers. Uh, the idea here is, again, whether that's ALDOT or a private company managing multiple receivers that are spread out across Alabama, and then taking that data, bringing it to a central server, having a software package that packages that error data and brings it back out to me so I can maintain that, that accuracy, that, that centimeter level accuracy. Talking about reliability, we want that to work 24-7 in ag, right? 365, because when we start planting, we want to implant yes. We don't want any interruptions because we don't have the ability to, to, to dial in or get into that network through the internet. So, and uh, we want that system to be monitored during those GPS, you know, if there's an issue with power or anything like that, um, we want that system to be 
uh, robust enough that it works 24-7, 365. So that's an important thing on that reliability aspect to ask. So we got um, just some things. So guys, you take a John Deere and what we call a single baseline solution. So you have a base station directly uh, communicating with a rover. That's called a single baseline solution. I can also, so any base station communicating directly to a rover, there's only one base station, that's a single. And no matter how that, we have seen very good accuracy out to about 25 miles before the accuracy will start to degrade on you. So about 25 miles is our rule of thumb on a single baseline solution. If you can communicate that far, that's always the big thing. Yeah. If you can communicate that far, we can keep good accuracy you, as a as a operator of the tractor you will not notice any degradation in the, your accuracy it will go right down the road for you and you'll never know you get beyond 25 miles a lot of other things kick in it could or could not you might be a little bit more off than what you need uh, the other thing is what we call a true network solution and that's a uh, multiple base stations that yeah. would surround you and we're pulling data from all those base station uh, base stations and using the correction data from all those and communicating that to the base and doing a much better job, typically we're going to be able to cover a lot bigger area than what a single base. Uh, so if you're going across counties and you're purchasing like a Trimble VRS or ALDOT Coors Network does have a network solution, you don't have to worry about that. It'll It's looking at all the base stations around you and getting you the best solution to your RTK receiver. So with that, there's cores, continuous operating base station. We'll go through this real quick. And Al Aldot here in Alabama manages that. Again, it's a free service that us and Ag, we can take, take a advantage of, okay? And the other thing, oops, we'll go backwards. Um, but the other thing to remember is for Alabama, John Deere, uh, and several parts of the state has their own kind of networks that they yeah. put up and using the receivers that you see here on the table today. And also Trimble is a very popular, what we call a Trimble VRS solution, which is a, a true network solution using multiple base stations is available here. And those would be your, your primarily and most used ones here in the state. Coors, John Deere, and Trimble for Alabama. Lastly, just to think about this is one thing that people get maybe a little confused on is when we're talking about a GPS receiver, I'll take this GPS receiver right here, it's called update rate. So how often does it put a position out? And typically we, back in the day, we would talk one hertz, but now we talk five or 10 hertz. So if I have a sprayer traveling at 15 or 20 miles an hour mark, a one hertz not gonna update me enough to keep me mm. on row. So I'm going to probably need a, a more likely a 10 hertz receiver that's kicking out uh, positional information 10 times per second in order for me to, to, for that navigation system or guidance system to work properly. So when we think about update rates, 1 hertz is, is, could be used for like yield monitoring. We're going very slow, but as we increase our in-field speed, more likely you're going to probably need a 5 or 10 hertz receiver. Most people are not going to have to worry about that. Companies are doing a great job of making sure they're matching update rate to the field operation. So just something to consider that update rate if you're going out and just buying a GPS or GNS receiver. I would encourage people to buy one that's capable of 5 or 10 hertz because you never know what you might want to use it for. So with that, we're winding down here today on GPS. All, all we ask people to think about is, where, you're, where are you at in your precision ag program and what do you want to do? If you just want to go out and do some scouting mark, you want to do some yield mapping, soil sampling, maybe even variable rate, you can get by with that WAS or some of those uh, sub-meter type correction services that I mentioned. If we're really going to get serious on planners and some people tell that, you know, like an Omnistar HP or SF2 would work in some cases, but if we're really going to be serious about trying to manage our planners, uh, Really, RTK is what we're recommending. Decimeter does work, uh, like our SF2 as mentioned. Uh, but if we're going to go to strip tillage, followed by planning, I would recommend being RTK. If we're really going to go to that level where you know 
controlled traffic, RTK is really going to be what you need. So again, select the right correction for the field operations that you're wanting to start out with or as you grow in your program, make sure you're getting the right correction to meet those expectations. So the last things that we'll talk about, and that boils it down from a farmer or ag industry perspective, if I'm going out and I want to do field operations, define what those field operations are going to be with my precision ag technology, figure out what kind of accuracy do I need. Do I need RTK? If so, go to those dealers to, and talk to them about some of these things. Do I need pass-to-pass -pass or is long-term accuracy? You know, long-term would be very important like in our, in our peanuts. Yeah. I plant and I need to dig right over top of it, you know, several months later. Um, that's important. Well, not just peanuts, but on soybeans and corn, where, you know, on our sprayers being so big. Yeah. I mean, if you can stay in the same track, that's going to make a big difference every year. Absolutely. But there is a difference between pass-to-pass -pass accuracy and everyone always reports pass-to-pass -pass accuracy on literature, but normally the long-term accuracy might not mm -hmm. be stated. So there's a difference. Yes. Don't expect someone to tell you there's 6 to 13 inches of pass-to-pass -pass accuracy, and that's going to be the same for next year. So how are you going to get your correction or what's available to you? What's your source of that GPS correction? That's, a, that's sometimes a, a, a hurdle that, you know, what is available to me? Who do I need to go talk to? We recommend GNSS receivers today. It's, a, it's just been a real positive uh, result here in the state of Alabama because of what we talked about, more receivers, more uptime. And then the final thing that a lot of people forget about is these are all got boards in them. And every once in a while, each and every one of them have a firmware update that need to be run on them, typically at least once a year, maybe multiple times. But if you buy one that's not upgradable in three or four years, it's worthless. It's, you can maybe still use it, but you might not be using the most advanced algorithms that they keep working on to improve these each and every day. So again, is it upgradable? I would say all these on the, on the table, whether it's the Raven here that's showing, the Trimble, the John Deere's, they're all upgradable. We're doing a pretty good job of finally getting that employed and, and being available, but are they upgradable? Because there's always something new that they've done to either correct something or improve the, how they function. So with that, again, think about what you're doing. This is from uh, Iowa State. If you look at those blue lines out there, the same tractor, same system. WAS is the blue lines. The red and yellow are those decimeter level, but going down through there multiple times, you don't see that red or yellow line moving like that blue line. So again, think about what you're trying to accomplish and what field operations that you're trying to go out and perform. So with that, I kind of giving a broad. John, thank you so much. If uh, you're taking a test, if you want a certificate, let me advise you to go ahead and take that test now because tomorrow morning you won't remember as much as you do now. If you need to watch the video again, we've covered, I mean, this has been a meaty presentation. This is a, I don't know that the rest of them will be this. This, this is the, the middle concept that you need to understand this to go on to the other stuff. So if you need to watch the video again, do take the test, 10 questions, and it'll help you understand how much you understand. John, thank you, and we'll be here for Unit 3 in just a bit.